And good evening. My name is Evan Weiner. Uh, I've been a journalist since 1971, and uh, John Mavitt and I worked together between 1988 and 2003 on a radio show. Uh, uh, it was a vignette uh, that ran for about three minutes every day, and I used to grab stories for him. And he says, hey, Weiner, you know what you should do one day? I said, no, what should I do? He says, all those stories you got? put them in a book and talk about it. And it became America's passion, how a coal miner's game became the NFL in the 20th century. And that's uh, Beanie Feathers, who played with the Brooklyn Dodgers of the National Football League. This is a game in Pittsburgh, the cover of uh, the book. And uh, he's being brought down, maybe with some unnecessary roughness, if you take a close look at where the tackler has his hand. And look at the referee. He looks like he's uh, ready to play golf more than uh, he's refereeing a football game. This was the Brooklyn Dodgers playing the Pittsburgh Pirates before the team became known as the Steelers at Forbes Field in Pittsburgh. And uh, I can't tell you who won the game, but I can tell you this. Uh, Feathers was a pretty good running back. And the Brooklyn Dodgers National Football League franchise was owned by uh, one of those uh, bootlegger bookie gambler type guys uh, by the name of Big Bill O'Dwyer. And if you look at the early days of football, you'll see a lot of ruffians played football. And a lot of guys, uh, bookies, uh, guys who uh, ran numbers, guys who won big at, tra at the racetrack, who uh, ended up with a football team, and also uh, guys um, had fun in the uh, roaring 20s. Uh, Football, the industry of football did not have a business plan until, say, 1958 or so. So it just kind of grew like uh, Turvin. It just grew and grew and grew, but nobody knew what they were doing in terms of growing the game of football. But uh, the game of football is the most important game in the United States. It's America's most passionate game, and of course, some of it has to do with uh, gambling. So we have gone from the mom and pop NFL stores, George Hallis, Tim Rooney, uh, and Art Rooney, and Dan Rooney in Pittsburgh, Tim Mara in New York, uh, Curly Lambeau in Green Bay, gone from the mom and pop store to a billion dollar business. And the roots of the game basically are in Western Pennsylvania, although not far from you are, where you are in Summit, New Jersey, uh, was the first football game. And that was down uh, with Princeton and Rutgers. That was in 1869. And that's um, a drawing uh, of the game. Uh, the game of football then and the game of football now have only one thing in common. It was called football. And uh, Princeton against Rutgers, there were like 25 men on each side on the field. 11, of course, today, 11 on 11. And uh, the game was played in New Brunswick, New Jersey. And Rutgers won that game by a score of 6-4. to four. The game was played with two teams of 25 men. It was rugby-like rules. And uh, the teams lined up with two members of each team remaining more or less near the goal line in the hopes of being able to slip over and score from an unguarded position. The other 23 were divided into groups of 11 and 12, 11 fielders lined up in their own territory as defenders, and the 12 Bulldogs carried the battle. And that's how football was played back in 1869. There is no resemblance to the game today. Uh, it took about seven years, and a guy by the name of Walter Kemp up in New Haven, uh, the coach of Yale University, uh, was responsible for writing up the first rules of the game. Uh, and he's known as the father of American football, and Yale has had a long, long, long time tradition of having football up in the Yale Bowl, uh, which was built in the 20th century. This guy, the guy's name is Putch Hefflinger, and uh, he was uh, the first paid player. Uh, he was given $500 by the Allegheny Athletic Association. Uh, to play football against the Pittsburgh Athletic Club or the, uh, or the PAC. Um, both of them wanted him on the team, and both were uh, throwing money at him. 
And uh, eventually uh, he was paid uh, by the uh, AF, AAA and he initially took money from the PCA and then jumped over to the other team. But think of that. He's paid $500 in 1892 to play football. He became the first person to play football. He made a lot more money than guys in the 1920s. Uh, uh, about uh, 10, 12 years ago, I was talking at the Riverdale Y, and uh, there was a tall guy who looked like he was 90 years old. He was in great, great shape. And he said to me, I played with the Stanton Island Stapletons and, and the Giants, so a couple of games with the Giants in the 1920s. And uh, we got to talking. I said, well, how much did you get paid? He said, we were lucky we didn't have to pay them. Say so we got about $10 a game in the 1920s. This guy in 1892 got $500. This is a 16-year-old player by the name of John Brailier, uh, who was highly sought after in 1895. And he became the first pro player to openly turn pro. He took $10 plus expenses to play for uh, Latrobe, Arnold Palmer's home uh, base. Latrobe YMCA against the Jeanette Athletic Club. Uh, the Allegheny Athletic Association fielded a completely professional football team by 1896, but they only played two games in 1896. And that is the Latrobe football team in 1897. I like the guy with the, with the derby uh, over the shoulder of one of the players. And you can see they had some big guys uh, on this particular football team. And again, the football played then has no resemblance to the football that is played now. The Latrobe Athletic Association, now in Western Pennsylvania, became the first team uh, to play a full season with only professionals, and that was in uh, 1897. Meanwhile, the NFL's oldest team is actually plays in Glendale, Arizona now, and the team is called the Arizona Cardinals. But it started out life in the 1890s, uh, in the gay 90s, um, in Chicago. And um, it was named after the local athletic club, a neighborhood team. Um, the Morgan Athletic Club was formed on the south side of Chicago. The team would later be known as the Normals, then the Racine Cardinals. The Cardinals, because it was Cardinal Red, Racine Street in Chicago, and then the Chicago Cardinals then the St. Louis Cardinals, then the Phoenix Cardinals, and the Arizona Cardinals. Um, the team would end up in Arizona by 1988, and uh, in 1994, it got its latest name, the Arizona Cardinals. It is the oldest continuing operation in professional football starting in the uh, 19th century. Chicago had a football league by 1902. Uh, again, Football League is a whole bunch of semi-pro guys, some getting paid, some not getting paid, who just want to play football in some sort of league nearby. Nobody traveled. And uh, the Chicago Football League in uh, 1902 and the Cardinals, uh, they were now the Cardinals. Uh, they were the champions of the Chicago Football League. Now, baseball had an interesting say in the development of football. Connie Max Philadelphia Athletics and the Crosstown Philadelphia Phillies decided the baseball players could play football. And um, it was a three-team league um, with the Phillies and the A's, the baseball players, joining the Pittsburgh Stars. And even though it was a league in Pennsylvania, there was nothing uh, uh, interstate about it in 1902, they called themselves the National Football League. That was the first National Football League. The Chicago Football League, uh, that was around uh, Indiana and the city of Chicago and uh, nearby Wisconsin. Uh, it was formed uh, with the Chicago uh, Tigers and outside teams like Hammond, uh, which isn't very far from Chicago on the south side. It's right over the Illinois-Indiana border. Rockford, Illinois, Decatur, Illinois, Racine, Illinois, and Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Also going on at the same time was the Ohio League and the New York State League. By 1904, Ohio had at least seven pro teams. They're not pro in the sense that you think of pro. A couple of guys might have gotten paid here or there. Some guys might not have gotten paid, but there were seven in Ohio. And remember, Ohio was fairly rich back in those days because of the port of Cleveland and the Great Lakes. Uh, Maslin, 
still a great football team in Maslin, now it's the high school football team, ended up winning the professional title of the Ohio Independent Championship of the Ohio League. Uh, while the pros were trying to do something, college football also was kind of taking off and was more popular than the pro game. But there was also a problem with the college game. 22 players were killed on the field in 1904, and 18 players were killed in 1905. And that got the attention of a lot of people, including Theodore Roosevelt. Now, Theodore Roosevelt is in the Oval Office, and he is getting hammered by Charles Elliott, who is the uh, president of Harvard University. There was no love lost between uh, Theodore Roosevelt and Charles Elliott. In fact, they hated one another, Roosevelt being an alum of Harvard. And uh, anything, it's like the, the Groucho Marx movie, whatever it is, I'm against it. Um, Roosevelt and, and Wilson, whatever Wilson want, whatever it was, I'm against it. But football is becoming a problem because of the reported 40 deaths over a two-year period on the field. And Roosevelt decides to use the bully pulpit to make a threat. He said he's going to ban football in America unless rules are implemented to make the game safer. But of course, nobody can figure out just exactly how do you make the game safer? How, do you, how could you end the game also? Well, making the game safer was a lot easier to end the game. Uh, but Roosevelt just threatened to ban the game, and that was enough to get uh, Charles Wilson and Walter Camp and the people in Princeton to the Oval Office in 1905 and discuss how do you make the game safer. So Roosevelt would take the three heads and bang them together. Eventually, it would lead to the formation of the NCAA. Uh, Roosevelt and Elliott weren't, weren't buddies. Uh, the Harvard contingent wanted to change or just drop football. Walter Camp and Yale, remember Camp wrote the rules almost 30 years earlier, he wanted to keep it as is, and Princeton was there as well. But these cartoons were in newspapers talking about football. And if you look at that, you got skull and crossbones uh, in a position where you're about ready to snap the ball. Death wrapped around the uniform. The 12th man, our 12th player in every football game, death. And take a look at the football. The football is the size of a watermelon. It is not the same size as the football is today. There was no forward passing in the game at that point. Roosevelt, I demand that football change its rules or be abolished. Change the game or forsake it. But there were a couple of things that Roosevelt didn't want to do, like end football. He wanted to make it safer, but he had reasons not to end football. First of all, his son, Theodore Roosevelt Jr., suffered major injuries in high school and college, but enjoyed the game. Roosevelt was also a rugged outdoors man, and he thought that uh, being vigorous ha happened to uh, uh, help your health because he was a sickly child, and then he got outside, and he was doing all kinds of things, and he became this rugged individualist. Uh, and he also had a soft spot for the game. Uh, if you remember the uh, Spanish-American War, 1898, as William Randolph Hearst once said, you supply the war, we'll supply the pictures for his newspapers. Well, Roosevelt was the Assistant Secretary of the Navy, and he decided to join the troops uh, in Puerto Rico and in Cuba and go up San Juan Hill. And he went up San Juan Hill with soldiers, and 10 of the Rough Riding soldiers, or the Rough Riders soldiers, uh, gave their occupations as football players when they enlisted in 1898. So Roosevelt has a couple things about football that he likes his Rough Riders and his son playing football. That may counterbalance or, or even outweigh what Charles Elliott wants in Harvard. But eventually they did get down to brass tacks and the American Football Rules Committee was formed. And in 1906, there were plays designed to open up the game, such as the forward pass to make it less dangerous to play. Um, there would be another summit about football in 2014 with Barack Obama, uh, 99 years later. Was the game made less dangerous? Well, as a reporter, I could tell you I have done stories 
with a whole bunch of people uh, who have played football, who have told me about their brain damage, about their inability to function because their head was hit so many, so many, so many times over the years. Uh, the NFL kind of knew something was going on, and I'll tell you a story from my friend Hal Uplinger. Uh, Hal Uplinger was a television producer. He played basketball at LIU, Long Island University, under Claire B. Uh, he went into TV. He played one year in the NBA with the Baltimore Bullets and then went into TV and then was out in KNX in Los Angeles. And he invented instant replay uh, with Tony Verna. But uh, on CBS during an Army Navy game in 1963. But uh, he was also the Green Bay Packers TV producer for CBS, and he was with the Packers every week during the Lombardi days, the glory days from 1962 uh, until the uh, second Super Bowl. And Hal was telling me a story that uh, the Packers were in Santa Barbara preparing for what was the uh, American Football League, National Football League World Championship game, now today called Super Bowl I, but it wasn't called Super Bowl I at the time. And that was in January of 1967. And uh, Lombardi, Vince Lombardi was there along with Tom Hartman, uh, Pete Rozelle, the commissioner of the NFL, and Hal. And Hal was telling me a story that uh, the commissioner, Pete Rozelle, was asking uh, Tom Hartman and Lombardi, uh, are players more cuckoo today than they were in the old days? Uh, knowing that, um, that they were getting injured uh, or getting brain injuries. And um, Harmon said that uh, it's probably more now than it was when he played because he wore a leather helmet while he played college. And he said, guys had respect for the head. He said, once those plastic helmets came in, guys used their heads like missiles because they thought they couldn't hurt each other. And uh, if you ever go to the Pro Football Hall of Fame in Canton, uh, I knew Sam Huff, and Sam Huff, uh, there was a, uh, a traveling Hall of Fame, and I was covering the NFL owners meeting down at the Arizona Biltmore, uh, or Palm Springs, one of the two. And uh, Sam said, come here, I want to show you something. And he was showing me an old New York Giants helmet, and it looked like it was a fender that was bashed in. And I said, where's that from? He said, when Jimmy Brown and I hit head to head, the collision was so hard, it just ruined the helmet. Um, so f is it less dangerous to play today than it was in 1905? Maybe it's less dangerous, but not that much. Uh, the committee passed legislation that led to the introduction of the forward pass. Uh, they changed the distance to be gained for a first down from uh, first and five to first and 10, which means nobody was picked up and thrown anymore. And uh, all mass formations and gang tackling were banned. Uh, again, uh, it was supposed to make the game safer, but uh, it may not have done so. Jim Thorpe was the greatest athlete, according to the Associated Press, in the first half of the 20th century. And uh, there was uh, a movement to make football, professional football, solid. And uh, he would sign a contract with the Canton Bulldogs. Uh, Jim Thorpe, of course, the great athlete uh, who won Olympic medals in 1912. He signs with the Bulldogs in 1915. Jack Cusack is the uh, owner for whatever that means. Uh, usually the captain was the owner. And uh, he names the team the Canton Bulldogs uh, with Thorpe and uh, former Kyle Lyle teammate Pete Kalick starring. Canton went 9 0 1 to win the Ohio League Championship. And they claimed the crown as professional football champion in 1916. Meanwhile, up in Green Bay, Curly Lambeau uh, was attempting to put together a football team for Green Bay. And uh, it is true, Curly Lambeau was the Green Bay Packers for a very, very, very long time. Um, and uh, he's one of these scoundrels uh, that uh, was around in the 1920s when the NFL started. In 1919, Earl Curly Lambeau and George Calhoun organized the Green Bay Packers whose namesake was Lambeau's employer, the Indian Packing Company. In some ways, Lambeau was a modern day uh, marketer selling the naming rights to his team, but only for $500. So he could have equipment and the team could use the uh, Indian Packing Company, which was a meat packing company. They could use the company field for practices, which was a good thing because it would save Curly Lambeau money. Uh, he would eventually join the NFL, eventually, 
but the NFL is not there yet. The Akron Pros, 1920. The Akron Pros. And take a look at the first row, the guy on the right side, Fritz Pollard. Fritz Pollard, one of the few Negroes in the National Football League. It wasn't called the National Football League at that point. Um, he was a great player. He was a great player, and he was also a coach. Um, and I'll get into that in a minute. Um, there was a need for a central league, according to people around football at that time. There was the Ohio League, there was Chicago, there was New York, they were all over the place. And the football, quote unquote, owners wanted to stop dramatically rising salaries. Hey, somebody might get a hundred bucks per game. And players continually jump from one team to another team, getting the highest offer. And um, there were some college players who were also moonlighting in professional football on the weekend, including one by the name of George Trafton. And uh, John Bankert, who was the, uh, he, he was the guy who ran the Pro Football Hall of Fame in Canton, Ohio, the late Jan, John Bankford, about 25 years ago was telling me a story about uh, uh, George, uh, who had, um, was missing an index finger. And he said, uh, if you look at the old pictures, there were a lot of guys who had face masks on with only the eyes cut out. And that wasn't to prevent injuries. That was to hide a player's identity because he was playing college on the weekends and then probes uh, on Sunday. And uh, anyway, uh, there was one guy who was uh, on the defensive side and he looks at Trafton and he sees his, this guy snapping and he's missing the finger. The next day, the two of them were playing football again, this time pro football. And the, and the guy says to Trafton, hey, didn't I see you yesterday? Didn't you play yesterday? He said, that wasn't me. He said, that had to be you. Who else only has four fingers? <laughs> uh, but uh, that's what they did back in those days. Uh, the Akron Pros, the Canton Bulldogs, the Cleveland Indians, and the Dayton Triangles. The Triangles would eventually become the Brooklyn Dodgers in the National Football League. Uh, had a meeting in Canton, Ohio, and uh, the result was the formation of the American Professional Football Conference. A second meeting would follow. There would be team representatives from Ohio, Indiana, New York, and Illinois in attendance. They decided to pay the 100 bucks to get in, and the name was changed to the American Professional Football Association. The NFL, and that team was the Decatur Staley's. That was George Hallis's team. George Hallis was the regular New York Yankees right fielder in 1919. I don't know if you ever uh, heard about his replacement in the Bronx. Uh, you might have heard of this guy. He, he's a, he was a heavy set guy uh, from Baltimore, Maryland, uh, named George Herman Ruth. George Hallis preceded George Herman Babe Ruth as the New York Yankee right fielder in 1919. And there is Trafton. Uh, at the end uh, there, the guy with the four fingers, the center, uh, he's in the first row on the left for the 1920 Staley team. The Chicago Bears start in 1921. A.E. Staley turned his decade of Staley's over to the uh, player coach, George Hallis, who moved the team into Cubs Park. That's what it was called. It was not Wrigley Field at that point. Staley paid Hallis $5,000, another one of these marketing deals, to keep the name Staley's. I think he, that was the automobile for one more year. Hallis made his halfback, Dutch Sternemann, his partner. Where does Fritz Pollard fit in in all of this? Well, he does. Uh, Art Shell is supposedly the first uh, African-American coach in NFL history, and uh, he made his debut back uh, in the 1980s um, at the Meadowlands against the New York Jets. And uh, he beat the Jets that night, or his team beat the Jets that night. And uh, Art Shell, uh, the former Raider, was talking about it, about being the first African-American, until somebody reminded him that Fritz Pollard was the coach of the Akron Pros in 1921. Fritz Pollard earned, uh, he earned his place in pro football history as one of two African Americans in the new league. In 1921, he earned another distinction. He was the first African American head coach ever in any sport. Uh, in the NFL, when the Akron pros named him the co-coach. Uh, 
he talked about that later in life in his biography uh, about uh, being in Akron in 1919. It was evident in my first year at Akron back in 1919 that they didn't want blacks in there getting that money. And here I was playing and coaching and pulling down the highest salary in pro football. Uh, after 1933, Fritz, Pile, Fritz, Fritz Pollard had no place in football. And we'll get to that in a second. But here we go with Curly Lambeau and the Packers. They're getting into the, the big leagues, so to speak, playing with the Chicagos of, of the Midwest, uh, the big teams. Uh, Green Bay had to re with, uh, withdraw from the APFA in 1922 because they were caught using players like Trafton, uh, but he was with uh, Hallis. Uh, who had college eligibility remaining during the 1921 season. So they lose the team. But Curly Lambeau still wants to play football. So he says, hey, listen, give me a second chance. An NFL team costs 50 bucks. 50 bucks. That's all he paid to buy back the franchise in 1922. Local merchants arranged a $2,500 loan for the club and set up a public nonprofit corporation to operate the team. Since 1922, or 98 years later, the Green Bay Packers technically have no owner. They're owned by a bunch of stockholders, but the stock is worthless. You're just giving money into the team. It's run by a board of directors and a chairman of the board. You could not have this happen today. This is a one-off deal. Green Bay is still in existence, which is an amazing accomplishment because it is it would be a small city in the Midwest Baseball League. Not many people live there, but it's it's a regional team. The uh, Upers uh, from Upper Michigan, and along with the people from uh, Western Wisconsin and Milwaukee. Milwaukee actually is is the money driver of the team. Um, they're there. It's an anomaly. It shouldn't be there. They should be long gone. Uh, if the team ever is forced to fold or suspend operations, and this team is worth billions, uh, over a billion dollars now, uh, if it ever has to uh, suspend operations, the local VFW uh, outpost in Green Bay would end up with all that money, which would be a billion dollars. Uh, Green Bay is not going anywhere. The NFL will bend over backwards to make sure that Green Bay is in the league because Green Bay is a special market for the NFL. Now, if I said to you the most valuable player in New York Giants history, history, who would you say? Who would you say is the greatest player in New York Giants history? Frank Gifford, maybe, Andy Robustelli, Lawrence Taylor, somebody of that nature, you'd be wrong. Because the greatest player in New York Giants history never played a down for the New York Giants. His name, Red Grange, the Galloping Ghost. And he was one of those 1920 stars, you know, like Jack Dempsey and Babe Ruth and Al Jolson and Rudolph Valentino. Uh, he was up there. He was the great football player from the University of Illinois, and he saved the New York Giants franchise and never played it down for the New York Giants. The Giants should retire number 77 uh, in Red Grange's honor because without him, the Mara family would never have lasted as the Giants owner. Uh, Red Grange may have saved not only the New York Giants, but the National Football League. It was late in the 1925 season. The season actually is over, but the National Football League Chicago Bears signed halfback Harold Red Grange before his college eligibility was up at the University of Illinois, and he goes with Hallis. The Grange signing clearly violated NFL rules against signing players before they completed their college eligibility. No matter, George Hallis was running the league by that point. Um, what Hallis did was cut a deal with a guy named C.C. Pyle, who was a player agent, one of the first player agents, and he was Red Grange's agent. And uh, they go, Hallis goes with Grange and the Bears on a barnstorming tour of America in 1925. Uh, hey, clearly violated the rules, but 
the barnstorming tour saved the NFL, and here goes why. Thanksgiving Day. Now, Grange, you could hear his, about him on radio, or you could go to the movies and watch a uh, silent movie and Fox movie to him and see him run. On Thanksgiving Day, 1925, 36,000 people, the largest crowd in pro football history, watched the Chicago Bears play the Chicago Cardinals. It wasn't Wrigley Field yet. It was Cubs Park. Uh, the home of the Chicago Bears. Uh, at the beginning of December, the Bears went on an eight-game, 12-day barnstorming tour. It was St. Louis. It was Philadelphia. It was New York and the Polo Grounds. Mara is not doing very well. In fact, he's doing terribly in 1925. He's got this big stadium, and they're playing Chicago in some sort of exhibition game, and there are over 70,000 people that pack the place. With the proceeds of that, Tim Merritt, owner of the Giants, a gambler, a bootlegger, a money runner, has money to operate not only in 1926, but 1927, 1928. And finally, finally, uh, New York has a successful football team. No more Staten Island, Stapletons, although there would be a Brooklyn Dodgers football team. They also go to Washington, which did not have an NFL team at that point. They go up to Boston, no NFL team there. Go to Pittsburgh, Detroit, and then back to Chicago. All in all, Red Grange is the hero. Uh, like I said, he saved the New York Giants franchise. Somebody else would have come in in New York who wouldn't have been the Maris, but he saved it. 73,000 people come to see him play at the Polo Grounds. Uh, the record attendance is beaten out when they're out, uh, the Bears are out playing the Los Angeles Tigers in the Los Angeles Memorial Coliseum before 75,000 people. Now, Grange had a very short contract just for the rest of the year, and he wanted to get, he and uh, his agent, C.C. Pyle, wanted a National Football League expansion team in 1926 at Yankee Stadium. But uh, Tim Mara, who Grange saved, uh, from oblivion. Tim Merrow was being protected because he was in the NFL, and uh, there was going to be no competition. The NFL said no to Grange. An American Football League would form, and Grange would head the New York Yankees American Football League team, a league formed by C.C. Uh, Pyle, also uh, Los Angeles Wildcats in that league, Philadelphia's in that league. Um, Grange had a five-year lease at Yankee Stadium, and uh, Pyle announced the formation of the American Football League, which was a showcase for his client. Uh, it was a road team, uh, the Los Angeles uh, Wildcats. They never played in, uh, in L.A. The first NFL team was the L.A. Buccaneers in 1926. It was a road team based in Chicago, some Californians there. University of California, University of Southern California alumni. One alum that they didn't get was a guy by the name of Marion Morrison. And you probably know him better as the Duke, John Wayne. He was thrown off the USC football team. He uh, would go to the Fox lot and would be an extra in movies, in the silent movies, and then the rest is history. John Wayne became a megastar. The LA Buccaneers did play two true home games in Los Angeles. Uh, both of them against uh, the AFL's New York Yankees with Red Grange. The Buccaneers also played two games in San Francisco, including the last game of the Buccaneers' existence, an exhibition game against the AFL's Wildcats of Los Angeles. So what were football salaries? Well, I talked to the guy in Riverdale. He told me he got 10 bucks a game as a wide receiver. Uh, supposedly, football salaries range between 75 bucks and 100 bucks a game. The average ticket price less than a buck a game. Typical roster consisted of 15 players. Revenues initially generated solely through paid attendance and the sale of food, and maybe if they had a parking lot, parking. The standard game contract provided a guaranteed payment for the visiting team, about thousand dollars against the visitor's cut of 40 percent of the gate receipts after deducting 15% for rent, rental and maintenance of the field. And there is um, Curly Lambeau on the right and George Hallis. One of the hottest rivalries ever in the NFL is the rivalry between the Packers and the Chicago Bears. Uh, it's legendary, supposedly, and they supposedly hate one another. 
except they don't. They needed each other. Uh, George Hellas needed Curly Lambeau in the 1930s, and uh, Lambeau's gone from the Packers around 1950, but the Packers Board of Directors desperately needed Hellas to help raise money for a new stadium in Green Bay. So they relied on one another. By 1931, the Depression hits. The NFL is down to 10 teams, down to eight teams, eight teams in 1932. Curly Lambeau saves the Chicago Bears. Hallis is going under. Now, Hallis also had a sporting goods company as well in Chicago, but his team is going under. He doesn't have the money to meet a payroll. And Curly Lambeau somehow has the money to meet a payroll. And he does. He lends Hallis I had a lot of shady characters as friends uh, as well, and his brother's name was Muggs, uh, who also had a lot of shady Chicago characters as friends during the Depression and during Prohibition. Anyway, uh, Lee Remmel, who uh, ran public relations for the Green Bay Packers about 25, 30 years ago, uh, I was in Green Bay one day and he said, come with me, I want to show you something. I said, well, what are you going to show me? He said, I want to show you something. So we walked to the Green Bay Packers Hall of Fame, and uh, he goes to a back room, and he says, take a look at this. And on it is a piece of paper, George Hallis, writing an IOU to Curly Lambeau, IOU $1,500. Curly Lambeau saves the Chicago Bears, and that letter is in the Green Bay Packers Hall of Fame. Uh, football... College game was more popular. Newt Rockney and Newt Rockney's uh, pep talks in the 1920s, the four horsemen of Notre Dame. Uh, you know, sports writers used to write prose and poetry, not what they write today. Uh, that was expected from Grantland Rice back in those days. Early Hollywood movies were based on the college game. They were not based on the NFL game. So the NFL, unlike baseball, which actually got a lot of assists from silent movies and Pride of the Yankees, of course, and also Abbott and Costello and comedy routines and, and even going back to Take Me Out to the Ball Game uh, and also uh, Casey at the Bat. Football didn't have that. They did not have that kind of outside influence that made the game more popular. At least the NFL did. And college did a little bit. Horse Feathers, my favorite college-related movie, done in 1932 with the Marx Brothers. Absolutely holds up. Uh, Groucho, as Quincy Adams Wagstaff, is the new president of Huxley University. And he wants to beat their arch rival, Darwin, who they haven't beaten in about 30, 40 years. It was written in 1932. Um, and uh, he goes looking for football players uh, in the local speakeasy. Swordfish uh, was the password to get in. And instead, getting two football players, he gets Baravelli and Pinky, Chico and Harpo Marx. And they're the two that they hire uh, to uh, win the fo big football game. And of course, they're throwing money at people uh, to play for uh, both Huxley and Darwin, and a lot of money running on Darwin and the football game. Mickey Mouse and Popeye were subjects in two football cartoons. And there was even a song. Uh, it wasn't like take me out to the ball game but it was you gotta be a football hero to get along with the beautiful girls it was a song by al sherman buddy lewis and uh rather buddy fields and al lewis not the al lewis who played uh schnauzer in car 54 where are you or grandpa Munz munster uh different al lewis you gotta be a football hero to get along with the beautiful girls uh, and you got to be a football hero, right? Look at these four guys, uh, Zeppo, Groucho, Harpo, and Chico, all football heroes. All of them were like five foot three inches tall, but they won the football game for Huxley. And Mickey Mouse here scores a touchdown. And uh, hey, there's a fight over Olive Oil's affections. And Olive Oil, as you know, is Popeye's girl. Uh, the NFL starts getting some business uh, in terms of getting some smarts in running the business uh, because of this guy, G.A. Richards. Now, he was not the long-term owner of the Detroit Lions, but he owned a radio station in Detroit, and he showed some of the owners how you make some money. Put the game on radio. 
my radio station in Detroit, and his Detroit team was on. Uh, and he also did something else. Uh, he started the Thanksgiving tradition in Detroit that lasts to today. Uh, the NFL discovers media as a revenue generator, thanks to Richards. Uh, and within years, five years, the NFL is also on TV. Brooklyn Dodger games are on uh, WNBT Channel 1 in New York, um, the uh, RCA station. Uh, the second incarnation of the American Football League uh, becomes a rival to the NFL in 1936. At that point, the NFL had nine teams and played in many of the largest population centers. And the AFL competed uh, directly with the NFL in many of those cities. That AFL folded, but the NFL took in one team, the Cleveland Rams in 1937. There would be another AFL that would start shortly thereafter. That, too, did not make it. If anybody belongs in a pro sports hall of fame, it's this guy, particularly when it comes to college football and pro football. You probably don't know who Charles K. McNeil is. He was uh, John F. Kennedy's mathematics teacher, mathematics teacher at Riverdale uh, a country day school in uh, the Bronx uh, while Kennedy lived around here in Bronxville before going on to Harvard. Kennedy did not grow up in Boston, nor did Robert Kennedy grow up in Boston. They grew up uh, up the street from me, literally, uh, in Bronxville, New York. Charles K. Mer uh, Charles K. McNeil in the point spread. Now, this guy was a compulsive gambler. Uh, and the Hall of Fame should put him in as a builder. No question about it. In the 1930s, Charles K. McNeil, University of Chicago grad, may have invented the point spread, which made the outcome of football games more interesting than just a final score for betters. Now, it's still not known if McNeil, if he came up with a system or borrowed it, but he refined it and opened up a new albeit illegal, but that was okay because she did have bootleggers and guys like Art Rooney who had a big day at Aqueduct and with that big day bought a football team in Pittsburgh with his winnings. Industry, people bet on scores, not which team won the game. And that uh, philosophy made pro football very popular among people. World War II. World War II was a real problem for the National Football League. Uh, initially, uh, they did not know if they could play the 1942 season. But uh, Franklin Roosevelt uh, talked to the baseball commissioner, or actually sent a letter to the baseball commissioner, Kennesaw Mountain Landis, when he said, what are we supposed to do? And that was the green light letter that Roosevelt sent to Landis saying, go ahead and play. Uh, I spoke to Dan Rooney about 15, 16 years ago before he became Obama's um, uh, ambassador to Ireland uh, while he was actively running the Pittsburgh Steelers. And uh, he was telling me, because he was a kid in 1942 with his brother Tim, that uh, when Roosevelt sent that letter to Major League Baseball, we, Pittsburgh Steelers, uh, took it as a sign that we should play. Uh, manpower was a big problem during World War II, particularly in Pittsburgh. Most teams uh, who were able to get, uh, who were able to field teams were near an army base, the Giants, of course, near West Point, Philadelphia and the Philadelphia Naval Academy, the Cardinals and the Bears, the Great Lakes Naval Station along with Green Bay. They were able to get players to play. Pittsburgh had nothing around it, so they merged with Philadelphia in 1943 and merged with the Chicago Cardinals in 1944 to field football teams. Uh, they would have uh, merged with uh, Brooklyn in 1945, except there was VE uh, Day and VJ Day, and the football season was able to proceed because there was no war anymore after the bombing of uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, surviving as a league, well, wasn't uh, that easy, but somehow the National Football League did survive. Uh, they would get competition, the NFL, in 1946. Arch Ward, the guy who uh, came up with the idea of the baseball all-star game in 1933 as part of the Chicago World's Fair, came up with um, another uh, idea, the All-American Football Conference. Cleveland Browns were in there, Paul Brown, and he hired two Negro players, Bill Willis and Marion Motley. 
And about uh, 30 years ago, a little over 30 years ago, I was talking to Paul Brown and I said, um, you broke the color barrier. I was like, no, no big deal. No big deal at all. They could play football. I didn't care. I mean, I guess if somebody was a player, he made my team. It didn't matter if it was black, green, red, chartreuse. He made my football team. The NFL is still a mom and pop operation. They get competition from the All-American Football Conference, and there is a major problem in 1946 that the owners have to meet head on. Daniel Reeves is the owner of the Cleveland Rams, and he is tired of Cleveland, and he decides he wants to move his team, and Los Angeles is an open market. Uh, it is a growing market, but not quite the market it would be when Walter O'Malley got there in 1957. Uh, Los Angeles was looking for pro sports teams. They reached out to uh, the National Hockey League back around 1944-45 to get a team uh, in uh, the National Hockey League. They were looking at baseball and they were looking at the National Football League and the All-American Football Conference. The All-American Football Conference did indeed have a team in Los Angeles the Los Angeles Dons, owned in part by some movie stars, including Don Amici. The NFL is allowed in Los Angeles after the Los Angeles Coliseum Commission says, you need Negro players, hire them. Well, Reeves tells his NFL owners about that, but uh, the NFL owners barred black players in the league after 1933. It was said, George Preston Marshall, who made no, didn't hide the fact that he was a racist at all, uh, he once told Maury Povich's father, Shirley Povich, the sports editor of the Washington Post, when the Harlem Globetrotters hire a white guy, I'll hire a Negro player. That's one of the Negro players who broke the color barrier after 12 years in the NFL. Uh, it was P George Preston Marshall who probably applied pressure to the other owners, uh, including George Hallis, who did not hire a black player, even though he claimed he wanted to, Curly Lambeau in Cleveland, Tim Mara in New York, just weren't going to open it up for black players. Uh, but the Coliseum Commission told Daniel Reeves, you want to play here? You have to abide by equal opportunity employment because we took federal and state money to build this place. That is Woody Strode in Spartacus. Behind him, Kirk Douglas. He's one of two Negro players to um, integrate the National Football League in 1946. The other is the running back, Kenny Washington. Um, San Francisco 49ers also were in the All-American Football Conference. They would join the NFL in 1950 with the Cleveland Browns and the Baltimore Colts. And like I said, breaking the color barrier was not easy. Not easy at all. The uh, All-American Football Conference had no color barrier, although although Paul Brown did not take Bill Willis or Marion Motley to play a game in Miami because they received death threats. Uh, their teammates welcomed them. These guys endured taunts, racial slurs, dirty play from opponents on the field. Meanwhile, in Los Angeles, uh, Washington and Strode, they might as well have dressed at home, just come out, ran on the field, did their job, and go home. They were not accepted by their Rams teammates. Um, the NFL is getting more businesslike by the late 1940s, early 1950s. Admiral TV, I don't know how many of you have an Admiral TV. Uh, I didn't, but I saw Admiral TVs. Uh, they decided to underwrite Los Angeles Rams uh, telecasts locally in the LA market. And they did so thinking it might be a loss leader, but they wanted to underwrite the games because they wanted to sell television sets. Television sets. And the way to sell television sets, have programming that people want. And they thought in Los Angeles, people would want Los Angeles Rams programming. Uh, to the point where the Rams had all of their games on TV in 1950. In 1949, just the road games, 1950, the home games. The Rams drew 300,000 fans in 1949. They drew about 50% of that in 1950. The NFL is becoming business-oriented. The commissioner, Burke Bell, who ran Philadelphia, another guy who would not hire Negro players in Philadelphia, told NFL teams, don't give your games away on TV. Don't give your games away on TV. 
the home games, let people come out. And uh, in 1951, none of the teams televised home games, which caused the problem in Chicago. The blackout rule is still being debated in Washington. All these years later, the FCC would like to see the rule end. Meanwhile, two teams in Chicago, and uh, when one team, the Bears, say the Bears, were at home, the Chicago Cardinals were on the road. Uh, but you had 12 home games. The Cardinals decided in the late 1950s to have four home games in Chicago and farm them out, the other games, so whether it was Minneapolis and Buffalo, so they could get games because both teams had a deal with uh, Bill Paley and CBS and WBBM in Chicago. So you could get some games in Chicago. That's the only way they could do it. Uh, it was a semi-pro operation. There was no question about that. That's Stan Jones, who uh, was with the Chicago Bears. He was a guard. The NFL had 13 teams. Jones said it was a semi-pro league. Uh, he was with the Chicago Bears. Uh, he was with them from, say, June, the eight weeks of training camp plus the 12 games until December. And then he would look for another job after the season. We weren't a full-time operation. A lot of people don't realize that. Football teams closed up after the last game of the year and packed everything away. And George Hallis wasn't a football, full-time football man himself. Most of the players were not paid during training camp. In fact, the players didn't even have their own equipment except for shoes. Teams shared all the other equipment. When a player was cut, um, somebody would buy a pair of shoes and then somebody would come in and they would sell a pair of shoes to those people. Hallis ran a sporting goods co uh, company down in the loop in Chicago called Hallis and May Sporting Goods Company. In 1956, Hallis, Art Rooney, and some of the other owners decide they were going to try to modernize a little bit. Hey, let's expand the league. Let's go into Houston or Dallas. Um, they were thinking, but we'll do it five, six years from now. We're not going to do it tomorrow. They had two bidders for the Chicago Cardinals, owned by the Bidwills. Uh, they were Lamar Hunt, a Dallas oil man, and Bud Adams, a Houston money man. And both of them tried to buy the Chicago Cardinals. They failed. Uh, both of them tried to get an NFL expansion team. They failed. But they watched the 1958 National Football League Championship game, considered by historians the greatest game ever played. Johnny Unitas bringing the Colts downfield in overtime and wins with Alan Amici going over 23-17 as the score. Art Donovan, who I got to know, uh, whose father was Joe Lewis, his referee in boxing, uh, told me uh, it wasn't the greatest game ever played. In fact, it was one of the worst games Baltimore ever played. They should have clocked the Giants. It was an important football game. Why? Because it was on NBC. And it was the New York Giants. And the New York Giants had handsome Frank Gifford. And they had a crowd that yelled, defense, 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 defense. Meanwhile, Johnny Unitas is on the other side. And he is getting quite the reputation as a field general. Uh, some of the game was lost. Somebody accidentally pulled the cord on the field. So it was lost. Uh, the game goes into overtime, and uh, the game was exciting. Hunt and Adams decide, you know what, we're not waiting for the NFL anymore. We're going to start our own football league, the American Football League. And uh, Hunt once told me, and it's in my football book, it was the kind of jolt that football needed to get it going in the 1960s, new markets in Denver, uh, also in San Diego and Houston and Dallas and Boston, um, it made a difference. Um, and uh, the most, for the most part, uh, the fans caught on with the teams in the AFL. And by 1966, the American Football League and National Football League would merge. And there is Pete Rozelle, who would come into the uh, National Football League in 1960. Uh, with fresh and new ideas. He was 33 years old. He got away from the George Hallises and the Maras and the Rooneys. And Roselle was a really smart guy. And there's Pete, 1986. Uh, he was walking away from me at that point, And I'm smiling because Pete must have said something like, oh, that's corny. He loved to use the word corny. Nobody else used the word corny. And I said to him, Pete, you are a product of the 1920s, aren't you? Nobody uses the word corny in 1986. And uh, Pete was 60 years old at that point. Uh, and Pete had some smart ideas, particularly watching what Lamar Hunt was doing with the American Football League. 
and basically co-opted virtually all of Lamar's ideas. And Lamar co-opted his ideas from baseball's branch Ricky because Ricky wanted to put a continental baseball league team in Dallas, a third major league team, gave Hunt uh, everything he needed to know about uh, putting together a team in the league. And Hunt said, thank you, Mr. Ricky. I'm not interested. I'm putting together this football team. And then he decides to take Branch Ricky's playbook and put it into the American Football League. And among the things that uh, was in there was all of the teams in football, uh, in the American Football League, should share television money equally, and that should make the teams competitive in theory. Roselle would take that idea, co-opt it, and put it into the NFL in 1961. The swinging 60s pro football changes from that game between the Colts and Giants uh, in December 1958 until 1966. As I said, the Continental Baseball League and Branch Rickey, they had a business plan. Lamar Hunt borrowed it for the American Football League and used their TV parameters. Uh, Congress and President Kennedy would have an impact in uh, 1961 uh, with the Sports Broadcast Act. And what Kennedy wanted was what the American Football League was doing under the radar, uh, violating antitrust laws. He wanted to group his 14 teams as one, Pete Rozelle, uh, and sell it to either CBS or NBC. Uh, he got cooperation. Emanuel Seller in Brooklyn, the congressman, uh, put it through the House in two days. It went through the Senate in one day with Estes Kefauer, got to Kennedy's desks, and by September 30th, 1961, Kennedy signs it. And its impact on the NFL is immeasurable. It puts the NFL into a totally different orbit. CBS is promoting it. Uh, football was getting some promotion. Time Magazine had uh, Sam Huff on the cover. Defense, defense, defense. And there was The Violent World of Sam Huff by Walter Cronkite uh, back in 1960. There was a bidding war that broke out for players between the American Football League and the National Football League after the 1964 season when Sonny, when David Sonny, as in Money World, won the owner of the New York Jets, to quote, how it goes, so, who I knew. Um, and I'm still friendly with his grandsons, Colin and uh, Justin. Anyway, he got money from NBC. David Sarnoff um, underwrote the American Football League. With that, Sonny Werblin signed Joe Namath. There was all kind of money being thrown around. The owner said, like they said in 1920, there are too many teams throwing around money. We need to halt the salaries and the two leagues would merge. Uh, that merger, uh, part of it was because, uh, well, uh, New Orleans wanted a team in 1965. There was an uh, American Football League African-American players boycott of New Orleans because of Jim Crow. Uh, New Orleans was abandoned and Congress had to pass this merger and it almost tripped up the merger because New Orleans didn't have a team. Uh, Russell Long, the Louisiana senator, and Hale Boggs, the Louisiana congressman, told Pete Rozelle, we're not voting for this unless, because we see no benefit for New Orleans. The NFL didn't want to expand and then change its mind and expanded into New Orleans. The merger takes place, and with that, the formation of the Super Bowl. Joe Namath makes the last great stride for the NFL, even though he's an AFL player at the time. Super Bowl one and two have minimal impact, but 1969, Joe Namath on January 6th guarantees in a barroom confrontation with the Baltimore Colts, Lou Michaels, the Jets are going to win the game and I'm the one who's going to kick your butt. Uh, and he goes public with that again. And uh, sure enough, the Jets, 17 and a half point underdogs, end up beating the Baltimore Colts 16 to 7. Roselle once told me that it was a very tough loss for the National Football League. Very, very tough loss because the AFL beat them and there was a heated rivalry between the two leagues. But he told me in retrospect, it was the best thing that ever happened because Joe Namath made the Super Bowl important. And there was the validation of all of the careers as Ron Mix, who was in uh, the American Football League, told me once, uh, he's in the Pro Football Hall of Fame, 
Uh, Namath's win validated the careers of every player who played in the American Football League between 1960 and that game, January 12th, 1969. And there is Joe Namath and me back in 1988, my buddy Bruce Morton to my left, who I still speak to after all these years. He's out in Denver. And behind them, the coach of the Super Bowl champion Jets and also the Baltimore Colts in 1958, the greatest game ever played, Weeb Eubank. Monday Night Football. Oh, it's still going. This is the 54th season of Monday Night Football. How it goes, Sell Keith Jackson and the Danderoo, Don Merlin. Cosell was hired because Monday Night Football was not supposed to be a football game. It was supposed to be entertainment. And Rune Orlich was the head of ABC uh, Sports, the uh, thrill of victory, the agony, agony of defeat, uh, wide world of sports, also the American Football League in the early days, the Pro Bowlers Tour, and a whole bunch of other things, including the Olympics. Anyway. Howard Cosell was hired for entertainment value, as was Don Meredith, who was recommended by Frank Gifford, who would take Keith's place uh, after the 1970 season. I asked Keith Jackson, uh, the other guy uh, in the booth, I said, was it a demotion? He said, no, it added years to my life. I couldn't keep up with those two guys. It's all business by the 1970s. Television contracts, money is pouring in. Uh, there was another group trying to start a football league called the World Football League uh, in 1974. Uh, the NFL tries to cut off two uh, possible uh, locations for the league, Seattle and Tampa, uh, and they take it away from the World Football League. Actually, in those days, the best two uh, markets for expansion were Long Island and Chicago. Uh, by 1974-75, the Players Association and the NFL owners uh, start going to war, complete with a strike of a New England Patriots, New York Jets preseason game. Uh, the Players Association would strike in 1982 and in 1987. There are all kinds of pains uh, in the 1980s. Uh, I am in the middle panel there, along with Harvey Meyerson, who was uh, the uh, attorney for the United States Football League and um, at that point, I don't think anybody was ready to ask any questions. We're getting all together. Uh, Meyerson won the suit, the uh, United States Football League, against the National Football League antitrust uh, suit because the NFL was acting like a predator, but he lost the money. And the USFL disappeared after getting $3, uh, treble damages, $3 in damaging the National Football League. And it was partially Harvey's fault because he didn't make it clear to the jurors why they should pay X amount of dollars. The jurors said they thought the judge was going to take care of that. And even after the verdict, Harvey was A, stunned that he won, and B, forgot to ask about, had you come about getting that money together? Just left it on the table, and that was the end of the United States Football League. So in the 1980s, NFL strike, USFL starts, ends uh, after the antitrust case. There was another player strike in 1987, and the game's popularity skyrocketed. TV enriched the owners in the players. Fox, Rupert Murdoch, struggling Fox network, which really wasn't a network. It, it, technically, it is and still is to today uh, a syndication arm. It's not officially a TV network, although that's just nomenclature. In 1993, Rupert Murdoch and Fox gave the NFL the biggest contract it ever got, taking the game away from CBS. And it was a good thing with Murdoch as well. Uh, the NFL became a political force in Arizona uh, with Martin Luther King Day. Arizona said yes in 1986. Then the governor said no. Evan Meacham in 1987. The NFL did give uh, Phoenix uh, the uh, or Tempe, Arizona, the uh, 1993 Super Bowl. Uh, but voters had to say yes to the Martin Luther King holiday. They did not in 1990. The NFL came back in 1992, said, you have the 96 game, all you need to do is approve the holiday. They did. And there was a lot of franchise movement in the 1990s, Cleveland to Baltimore, Houston to Nashville, uh, two of the moves that were made uh, in the 1990s along with uh, the Rams from Anaheim to St. Louis and the uh, Raiders from Los Angeles to Oakland. Uh, the Raiders now are in Las Vegas 
the uh, Rams are back in Los Angeles and the NFL expanded to uh, Cleveland and to Houston. And we wrap up with brain injuries. It's kind of been swept under the rug. Nobody talks about concussions anymore. Doesn't mean they've gone away. They haven't gone away. They're still there. Uh, and Colin Kaepernick, Kaepernick uh, taking a knee during uh, the uh, national anthem uh, in games one, two, and three of the preseason, getting caught by a writer or a writer spotting that in the third game. And uh, Kaepernick would ultimately get blackballed from the National Football League for protesting. His protest included police brutality against uh, minorities uh, in the United States. Uh, he supposedly was supposed to have a tryout last year. That didn't pan out. And he is still on the outside looking in and probably looking in for the rest of his life because he's been away too long and he's not coming back. But it is a well-oiled machine, the NFL. Although uh, there were some kinks thrown into that, uh, that well-oiled machine this year after the George Floyd um, killing in Minneapolis, the NFL uh, commissioner, Roger Goodell, saying that Black Lives Matter and suggesting to his players that they should speak out uh, for social injustice. Uh, Goodell's father, Charles Goodell, was a New York senator. He took uh, the job after Robert Kennedy was assassinated, and uh, he was against Vietnam. He was a Republican. He was against Vietnam, was on Nixon's hit list, uh, would ultimately lose in his uh, bid for uh, to finish out, not finish out, to for his own full term in 1970, uh, and uh, became an activist after that. And uh, Goodell uh, didn't follow that. Goodell well, was a very corporate guy in the NFL, starting with the New York Jets uh, as an intern in 1983 and being around the NFL forever. Concussions remain a problem. Uh, Kaepernick has pretty much disappeared, but social issues uh, have taken front and center in the NFL. And that was Tom's River, New Jersey, back in 1996. The Oakland Raiders, Phil Filippiano from uh, central New Jersey, threw a party one day, and I live to tell about it. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Robin, for uh, inviting me to the library. I hope you uh, enjoyed the talk. And uh, if anybody has anything, any questions, let me know or anything to say. Any questions? Any comments? Well, if we don't have any questions, you could unmute yourself if you have any questions, but if you don't have any questions, uh, we're gonna have, uh, we're gonna say good night. Uh, my name again is Evan Wiener. I wanna thank the library, the Summit Library for inviting me and um, have a uh, say, oh, we got, a, we got somebody here, hold on. Um, thank you, and uh, everybody stay safe and have a good holiday and be careful during the holiday season. And hopefully we'll talk to you down the line. And uh, thank you again, Robin, and uh, we will get uh, this recording over so other people could see it on your media sites, if that's okay with everybody. So good night, everyone. Bye-bye.